Hello, I am Professor Sims, and this video is Introduction to Microbiology. There are, not including this intro, 10 lessons for this course. If you're currently enrolled, please consult the syllabus and Moodle site for assignments and other course information. This is a challenging field of science, and therefore it is a challenging course. You're going to be um, expected to apply your knowledge, comprehend concepts. There is some memorization, but the course is not centered around memorization. It is a little bit of a deeper level of learning. You're going to have some research and communication uh, skill development. And obviously, it is an online environment, which includes some level of self-directed learning, which can be kind of challenging. but you will have guidance from myself and also from numerous resources available to you online. The textbook for this course is an online free OpenStax book. You can find it at the link listed here. It is also going to be in PDF form on the Moodle site. I absolutely do recommend that you download the book because if you have to go to the link every time you want to read the book, it can be time consuming. This is the cover page. I'm just going to page down to the table of contents. And all of these chapter titles you see there in blue, those are actually hyperlinks. So you can click on a chapter title and it will jump right to that chapter. So that saves you a lot of scrolling. The course materials on Moodle, there are numerous materials on Moodle for you. There's the news form, which I do use rather often. The syllabus with the course calendar, that you're going to want to make sure that you download and save in a prominent place. Read through the syllabus, put the course calendar in a prominent location because it's going to have every topic we cover, when we cover it, what days, assignments are due, and all of that stuff. The guidelines and the grading rubric for your writing assignments are on uh, the course materials module in Moodle. All of your writing resources, including APA writing guidelines, how to get in touch with the writing center on campus. The slides that are corresponding to these videos are going to be in Moodle. And of course, your quizzes, assignments. So if you are not already familiar with the Moodle site for this course, you're going to want to get familiar with it quickly and Make sure that your student email address is functioning so that you will be able to receive emails and updates from me periodically. Things to remember, I want to make sure that you know where the website is. My YouTube channel link is on the course materials page in Moodle. It's simply youtube.com slash c slash Professor Sims. So that's where all of these videos will be. It is also where many other supplemental videos like study tips and things like that. And the video even the lecture videos are designed to be supplemental. So you have to make sure that you are doing the reading assignment. There are things I cover in the videos that are not in the reading assignments, and there are things in the reading assignments that are not in the videos. So you've got to make sure that you're getting both. Okay. Each Moodle module has a quiz that's due for each lesson, and I will not accept late bonus assignments or late quizzes. Your written assignments, your semester project report, I will take those late, but they are subject to a 25% per day penalty, and that kicks in after the first day. Your exam and project information have their own modules on Moodle, so make sure you have a look through those. Each lesson has specific learning objectives, just like this one. And all of your policies for grading, late assignments, missed exams, again, all of that is going to be on the syllabus. If in doubt, if you're not sure about anything, look first on the syllabus, then look on Moodle. And if you still have questions, you just can't find something, please contact me via email. And my email is located on the syllabus. And uh, there's direct links to contact me via Moodle, including the news form. Okay. Now, if you need to come and visit me during office hours, I welcome I welcome uh, student visits during office hours. I have office hours that are designated for 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. every Monday and Wednesday during the semester. And if you cannot come during those times, then you can shoot me an email and we can make an appointment for a time that is better for you. Some tips for studying smarter, not harder. Uh, there is a lot of material in this course, and I just want to make sure that you guys understand that rereading, memorizing, rewriting, looking at old stuff, 
these are methods that were taught to you in K through 12 um, education, but they're not always the best. The problem is, is that they are all very time consuming. And if you're taking this class in the lab, and maybe you're taking AMP in that lab, and two other classes, and you're just not going to be able to reread everything. And you're not going to be able to memorize everything. It's going to be much, much more effective and less time consuming for you to take the materials and transform them in a way that helps you to better comprehend them. So this means like rewriting things in your own words. Take the things from the lectures and the book and try to put them into a format that you would use if you were going to teach it to someone else. Also, self-testing is invaluable. So this literally involves making um, practice quizzes. Make practice quizzes and use questions that are difficult to you. So this makes sure that you are studying things that you necessarily need to review. There's going to be things that come easily to you, and there are going to be things that are much more difficult for you to comprehend. When you are studying for an exam, focus on those things that are more difficult, and don't waste your time on the things that are not so difficult. And it is very uh, helpful if you can relate things that you are learning now to things that you have already learned in the past. And this can be other courses that you have taken before or things that you're taking concurrently. It's a world-building exercise. Everything in biology is related to everything in other sciences, especially for those of you that are on a nursing or a med school track or health professions track. The things that you learn in micro are going to come back again and again. So if you can relate these things to things that you're learning in your other classes, it's going to be much better for your overall comprehension. And the interleaving aspect has to do with varying your studying. So this is switching between topics or using different resources to study, those kinds of things. It is not a good idea to spend a three, four hour long block reading the textbook. Because about every 20, 30 minutes or so, if you're not taking a break or you're not switching lanes and looking at things in a different way, your brain's just kind of going into sleep mode and you're not going to recall that information. So taking breaks, making sure you get enough sleep and changing up the way that you are studying the material and the different resources you use. So maybe you're doing a self quiz and then you can look at the video and then you do some reading and then you look at some other topic altogether and you're taking breaks and you're letting Letting your brain rest in between those activities is going to be much, much more effective for your study. You do want to make sure that you, well, you're obviously watching this presentation now, which is good. You've, you've, you've got a good head start. Um, but you also want to read chapter one in the textbook. And don't forget PowerPoint slides supplement reading, okay? Uh, have a look at the intro module. Make sure you go in there and take the quiz and be mindful of the due date for the quiz. And there's no written assignment for this lesson. Let's go ahead and dive into the chapter one material. We're going to be looking at how ancestors improved food using microbes, causes of illness, and how they were explained in the olden days, key historical events associated with microbiology, how microorganisms are classified into species, and different types of microbes, different types of infectious agents, pathogens, and just general relevant background having to do with the field. So microorganisms, what are they? Microorganisms they're also called microbes for short, are living things that you can't see with your naked eye. Generally, we're talking about bacteria, yeast, mold, fungi, prokaryotes, protists, eukaryotes, viruses, all of these things that you generally can't see without a microscope. Throughout history, humans have used microbes to help them. Maybe they didn't really understand how everything worked, but they did understand that back during when cholera was running rampant, it was safer to drink beer than it was to drink water. And that's because the microorganisms that they had put into the flour and the hops and things were fermenting the sugars in there and they were filtering out you know nasty things. This is figure 1.3 this is a Saccharomyces cerevisiae which is a yeast. It metabolizes carbohydrates in flour, flour that's fermenting, and it produces carbon dioxide 
which makes the little bubbles and, and makes the bread rise. Now, this is also used to make ethanol, which is the alcohol that we can drink. So this is your beer or wine. Microbes are also used in the production of cheese, yogurt, sauerkraut, any number of things. But this figure, figure 1.1, is illustrating the fact that that we also use microorganisms to clean up the environment. This is a rescue worker that is working after the, the deep water oil spill. They used oil eating marine bacterium called Alcanavorax borcumensis, I think, to actually help get all of the, the bacteria out of the water and out of the habitat. Um, and then, of course, we also use microbes to treat infectious diseases. There are some microorganisms that we can use to create antibiotics, which seems counterintuitive, but it, it, it is what we do, and it's amazing. So long before the invention of the microscope, people were thinking on this. They were theorizing that infectious and disease, they were connected, and that they weren't caused by God striking us down or smiting us. It wasn't anything supernatural. There were living things that we couldn't see but that were being passed between us and in, this, in, in the time. We're talking about way back in Greek times, Roman Empire and stuff. This was just unheard of. But they were right. Hippocrates, they call him the father of Western medicine because he was one of the very first people that believed that disease had a natural cause, not a supernatural cause. Thucydides, he was one of the first people that was able to observe that survivors of an infectious disease, in, in this case the plague in Athena, were subsequently immune to future infection which eventually led to the development of vaccines. Marcus Terentius Varro, he proposed that disease could be caused by minute creatures, which cannot be seen by the eye. Now, after those guys, we had the invention and the first successful use of the microscope. So, Antony von Leeuwenhoek, eh, some people argue whether he was actually the inventor, but he was the first to actually perfect and use a simple microscope. He described bacteria way back in 1675. He was able to visualize tiny things that he called animalcules, and he actually was able to see them in a drop of water. So like uh, we're going to be doing a pond water experiment in lab where we get to see a lot of living microorganisms in pond water. Antony von Leeuwenhoek was doing that in 1675. Now eventually the animalcules became renamed as microorganisms by the end of the 1800s. During the Golden Age, right, so 1857 and 1914 is known as the Golden Age of Microbiology. And this included, the, some of your big hitters are Louis Pasteur and Robert Cope. Louis Pasteur, if you've ever heard of pasteurization, that's where it comes from. He was the inventor of that process. He's credited with lots of other innovations that advanced microbiology and immunology. Robert Coach, he was the one that was able to identify specific agents of infection, specific microbes that caused some of the worst illnesses in human history, including anthrax, cholera, and tuberculosis. He had very specifically lined out different postulates to determine whether a microbe was the causative agent of an illness. And he was basically the father of etiology, which has to do with the factors that come together that cause illness. And it's the focus of epidemiol epidemiological studies. And we're going to talk more about epidemiology later, but for now, Koch's postulates have to do with, okay, so first of all, you have to see, you have to be able to, able to observe a causative agent that is found in an individual that is sick, but is not found in an individual that's healthy. Then you have to be able to isolate that agent from the host and grow it. And then after you've done that, you take the agent and introduce it into a healthy person. If that healthy person then gets the disease and it's the same agent that was found in the diseased person and then the healthy person that was then exposed to it, then you know that that was the causative agent for that disease. Seems pretty simple, but he's the first one to figure it out. This here is a table that has a long, a long list of other scientists and, and, and other researchers and doctors that 
were a big deal in the golden age of microbiology, so the late 1800s, early 1900s. And this is kind of how I, I, I really recommend y'all study things. When you have a lot of names and dates, put them in a table. Some notable ones here are malaria, right? Charles Leverin, uh, typhoid, Carl Ebert. You've heard of pneumonia that was found, that was discovered by Albert Frankel in 1884, causative agent Streptococcus pneumonia, tetanus. Binomial nomenclature means you have a genus name and a species name, and those two things are together. That's where the binomial part comes from. The nomenclature is the name. So everything has a specific, standardized, scientific name, and the scientific name is in Latin, and it's the same no matter where you go, what language you speak. Okay, so a human being in English is human being, but in Italian or Spanish or French or whatever, they, it's something else. It's not human being. That's the common name. But the scientific name is Homo sapien, no matter where you go, no matter what language you speak, because it's a standardized scientific name. Phylogenetic trees, these show the relationships of different organisms based on their evolutionary history. The phylogenetic tree, the first one, just contained kingdoms and plants. Then came along Ernst, Ernst Haeckel, and he decided, well, we need a kingdom for protists too. In other words, our microorganisms. Robert Whitaker, he included five kingdoms in his tree, Animalia, Plantae, Protista, Fungi, and Monera. And then Carl Wise came, and he actually was able to use small subunit R RNA genetic data to create a, phy a phylogenetic tree that put organisms into just three groups, and this is the one we use today. Archaea, bacteria, eukarya. Figure 110, you have a look at that in your book that has a nice example of how the phylogenetic tree of life progressed throughout the years. In Archaea, bacteria, eukarya, we have bacteria in all three domains, microorganisms in all three domains. They're very, very diverse. They're very, very, very ubiquitous. They're found everywhere. Figure 113 gives some examples of colony morphologies, just different shapes of single cells of bacteria. You have cocci, bacilli, vibrio, cocci bacillus, spirillium, and then this true corkscrew is a spirochete. Archaea and bacteria are classified, they're both classified as prokaryotes. Prokaryotes don't have a nucleus and they reproduce asexually. They, they are named prokaryote because pro in Latin means before and carry is nucleus. Archaea differ from bacteria in so many ways, evolutionary history, genetics, metabolic pathways, cell wall, membrane composition. But both archaea and bacteria inhabit nearly every environment on Earth. A main difference, though, is that only bacteria have ever been identified as human pathogens, not archaea. Eukaryotes include algae, protozoa, fungi, and helminths. You carry, right, means true, you is true, carry nucleus. So they do have a nucleus. Algae are plant-like. They have, they have uh, chlorophyll. They reproduce by photosynthesis. They can be either unicellular or multicellular. Fungi can be unicellular or multicellular. Yeasts are unicellular. Molds are multicellular. And they obtain food from other organisms, just like we do, and they possess cell walls. Protozoa are all unicellular, but they have Again, they have nuclei and they have complex cell structures. They can even have pseudopods, cilia, flagelli, these things that they're, they actually use for locomotion and motility. They can move around. Helminths are multicellular parasitic worms. They are included in microbiology because their eggs and larvae are often microscopic. Viruses are acellular and they require a host to reproduce. So there is a whole school of thought out there that is arguing whether viruses are even living organisms because they can't reproduce on their own and they don't have any of these cellular uh, structures that we're used to seeing in organisms. I want to thank you guys for watching. Don't forget to do the reading. Check the description below for more videos related to these topics and leave your questions for me in the comments section.